Good evening. I'm Brock Reeve, Executive Director of the Harvard Stem Cell Institute. Tonight we're on the campus of the Harvard Business School at the iLab to talk about building life science businesses. The theme of tonight is what is a winning life science business concept? And to talk about that, we're joined by a panel of three leading venture capitalists. Doug Cole, a partner with Flagship Ventures, Jens Eckstein, president of SR1, the GSK Corporate Venture Fund, and Terry McGuire, founder and general partner at Polaris Ventures. All three are experts in the life sciences business and are here tonight to talk about their perspective of what is an investable opportunity. Uh, and what used to be the case in the investment world, what is the case today, and how that situation is changing going forward. Good evening. Um, my name is Wei Zhen. I'm Director of Commercial Strategies for HSCI. Welcome to the second event in our series. How many of you were here last Wednesday? Great. Special welcome to you. And I promise your drive home will be uh, less treacherous today. Um, so how many of you are uh, affiliated with Harvard? Scientists? And how many of you either have a startup company or are pressure testing a startup idea? Excellent. Um, before we talk about startup, I just want to tell you a little bit about our translational program, which I'm responsible for. I want to call your attention to our translational grant. So if you are Harvard affiliated, you can become a HSEI member if you're not already one, and can take advantage of our grant to support your translational effort. And you can also take advantage our network of capabilities that we build up. For example, we have our core facilities we have the, um, uh, a small molecule high content therapeutic screening center. We have the Center for Human Antibody Therapeutics. They have 100 billion clones in their library and can develop a new neutralizing antibody within seven days. Right? So the small molecule therapeutic screening center has been the cornerstone not only for our many uh, scientific projects but also for our industry collaborations and uh, some of the uh, antibody uh, candidates that the, uh, uh, um, the Antibody Therapeutic Center developed has been all licensed to leading pharma and biotech companies. We have the Center for Human Cell Therapy, ha uh, which has years of experience doing assay development and process development to support clinical trials, and we have the GMP cell manufacturing facility, IPS cell core, and also the humanized uh, neonatal mouse center, they can fully reconstitute mice with human immune system, including the NK cells. Very versatile tool for a large uh, set of, uh, uh, for a different set of uh, studies, including regeneration uh, and uh, uh, tissue engineering. So as Jody mentioned, the next event is on the 27th, and Jody and I are planning more sessions for the spring term, so make sure to join us on the 27th and also uh, check back in uh, for the spring events. And today, uh, we're very lucky to have three panelists who have deep experience funding life sciences ventures. And uh, um, I hope all of you have the sheet of speaker bios, so I'm not going to introduce them in detail. And uh, uh, we're going to go alphabetical, and the format is for the speakers to speak, to, uh, uh, speak for 20 to 30 minutes. And please hold all the questions till the Q&A session at the end. And first speaker is Doug Cole, general partner of Flagship Venture. And second is uh, Jens Eckstein, uh, who is the president of SR1 the venture arm of uh, GSK, and then lastly, uh, Terry McGuire, co-founder and general partner of Pla Polaris Ventures. <clears throat> well, thank you very much for the invitation to, uh, to speak tonight. Uh, I'm Doug Cole from Flagship Ventures. We are a Cambridge-based venture capital fund. Um, 
that manages $800 million worth of investments. Uh, and we focus exclusively on the life sciences. And um, what we primarily do is start and finance early stage platform biotechnology companies uh, in healthcare and sustainability. Um, so uh, uh, the, the formats in which we do that comprise two. One is a, um, uh, uh, a, a component called the Flagship Venture Labs, which is uh, a full-time group of people with some other people who then participate uh, from time to time dedicated to starting companies. Some of those are companies that are based on our ideas, and some of those are companies based on others' ideas. We're, we're indifferent as to where the ideas come from. Um, but but uh, with that starting point, we then conceive of the company, uh, sometimes file IP and actually do some science, uh, and ultimately assemble a team that will take the company forward. And then we also have a more conventional um, part of the fund that does investing in companies that have already been established by others. Um, so what I'm going to do in, over the next 30 minutes or so is first just speak briefly about the environment in which we do what we do. Um, and, uh, and then mention a, a very sort of simplistic way that I find useful to categorize companies as I uh, try to understand them or think about starting them. Um, and then to focus down a bit on a number of the particular questions and particular issues that we try to get our arms around uh, when we're trying to build companies or invest in companies. And then I'll, I'll, I'll finish up by just giving a few anecdotes that, that seek to illustrate some of the points that I make. Um, so no matter uh, where you look in the overall healthcare biomedical enterprise uh, at this moment in history, there are uh, some immense challenges that everybody is facing. Uh, if you look at the national level, uh, you know, everybody knows that uh, healthcare takes up $2.5 trillion of our economy, and uh, um, about 20 years ago it represented 12% of GDP. Now it's about 18% of GDP. Um, and whether or not that's a good idea is almost beside the point. Uh, I think just about everybody agrees we can't afford it. And so that's going to change. Um, if you look at pharmaceutical companies and the pharmaceutical industry, um, uh, the industry spends about $50 billion a year on uh, R&D and uh, has typically produced about 20 new drugs a year. There's been some ups and downs in that, but um, that's roughly what the output is. And so that's a very expensive proposition. Um, there was a, a report done by Morgan Stanley a year or two ago, the title of which was uh, Exit Research and Create Value. And they made the argument that what pharmaceutical companies should do is get out of research entirely and that their value would increase by doing so. Um, uh, the, the industry is, however, somewhat a victim of its own success. Um, the current uh, uh, ratio of branded to generic drug prescriptions is 30 percent to 70 percent. Uh, it used to be the opposite, 60 percent to 40 percent. And so what that's telling you is that with a legacy of a lot of success, the industry is now making things harder for itself because all of those generics obviously set a very low price point uh, and they raise the bar. The biotechnology industry itself uh, has clearly had some major successes and contributed a huge amount to uh, society and to uh, benefiting human health. But from some perspectives, it hasn't delivered the goods. Uh, there's been these numbers are a little bit out of date, but roughly $100 billion invested in, uh, in uh, the biotech industry and roughly $100 billion returned. Um, so um, that's not a great return overall. Um, and if you look at the many, many startups uh, that uh, uh, have been started over the years uh, and how many of those have really grown into companies that have produced multiple drugs, it's only a handful. And how many of those have uh, become companies that have actually created one drug that's had a, a significant impact on the world? That's only a few dozen. So this is out of several thousand companies. So um, uh, there's, there's lots of reasons to be um, very careful about 
making commitments in this area. And finally, there's the venture funds. And uh, to be honest, the venture funds over the last 10 or more years have done extremely poorly. Um, uh, there had been an expectation that venture funds would produce returns that consistently beat more standard investment classes such as stocks. And not only have they not done that in general, but in fact, a lot of them haven't returned money at all. Uh, and so this has led to a lot of soul searching and a sense that something is going to change and that the future is not going to look like it did in the past. Now, I don't want to um, say that uh, there's not a lot of reasons to be optimistic. And one can always view any challenges like the ones I just outlined as opportunities. And a lot of people, and presumably some of the people in this room who can do that successfully, will at end up creating value, contributing something, and, and making, uh, making money. Um, but I, I find that there's other reasons to be optimistic uh, um, beyond that. Uh, anybody who spends time with some of the great scientists and physicians in Boston uh, and elsewhere uh, cannot but believe that science is delivering the goods. And uh, almost daily, biological research is changing fundamentally um, how we understand uh, what the limitations are of what we can do. Uh, and an example, uh, you know, related to the Stem Cell Institute is, is that when um, Yamanaka, who just won the Nobel Prize, uh, showed that it was possible with four simple factors to actually get cells to be completely reprogrammed. Uh, that flew in the face of essentially everything that people believed up until then. Uh, I believe that that paper was rejected by some of the major journals because people didn't believe it. Uh, and it's just one example of uh, how exciting uh, things are out there. And just from my, pr my more personal perspective, I, I was a physician uh, and I trained, I went to medical school and trained in the 80s. Uh, and if I just stand back and think, where are we now in therapeutics compared to where we were when I was taking care of patients? It's a complete world of difference. HIV was an absolute death sentence in the 80s. MS was untreatable in the 80s. Uh, many cancers were absolutely hopeless in the 80s. Hepatitis C didn't even, was not even known to exist in the 80s. It was called non-A, non-B hepatitis. Uh, and now we have, uh, you know, treatments that are somewhere between miraculous or at least significant for all of those things. So I think that we need to be cognizant that it's hard, but I think that uh, we should all be very optimistic and just think about how we can take advantage of the, uh, the situation in front of us. Um, now, uh, one, one point that I think uh, is hinted at by some of the statistics that I alluded to is that um, uh, as one thinks about starting a company, uh, uh, it's important to be very disciplined because you, you want to be one of these exceptional few uh, that's created all of this value and not all of the others that have dragged the average down. But the numbers are not in your favor. And uh, and one question that I think is worth thinking about uh, is uh, even though the financing environment is difficult uh, and uh, it's often hard for companies to raise money, and when it's my company, I, I think that it shouldn't be hard uh, because I believe in that company. But the question is, given the track record that I alluded to of the biotech industry, of the venture funds, is there too little money or is there too much money? Are there too many ideas or are there too few ideas? And I would suggest that there's a difference between great scientific ideas and scientific ideas that are a great basis for starting a company. And that um, there may, even though um, times are hard, still be uh, too much money around. Uh, so I'll, I'll propose at least some approach that we have uh, to try to be sure that um, that the way that we're allocating our money and the way that we're spending our time is more likely to create successful companies. Um, just, a couple of, just a couple of numbers to put some things into context. Uh, as, as you probably know, the amortized cost of developing a drug, and you can do the math from the numbers I gave you earlier, is about $2 billion. So $2 billion to get a drug to market. 
um, the percent of compounds that make it from the initial phases of clinical trials to the market are, and people have different numbers, but it's, it's certainly no better than 1 in 20, and for some therapeutic areas, it's worse than that. Um, just to develop a single drug, not amortizing the cost, uh, costs, the numbers vary quite a bit, but typically $200 million, that can easily be $400 million, sometimes it can be $100 million. So those are some numbers that just put into context um, uh, some of the economic challenges um, as one is at the, at the starting line thinking about trying to create drugs. And I should say, I should have said at the beginning, that what I'm talking about for the purposes of these comments is therapeutic biotechnology startups, so not diagnostics companies, not research tools and other things where uh, there's different considerations. So with that backdrop, I'll, I'll ask you to uh, keep uh, four numbers in mind. Um, one number is $50 million. If <clears throat> a company is getting venture backing and uh, has to raise significantly more than $50 million in venture equity, it gets very hard for the venture investors to make a good return on that investment. Um, so uh, it doesn't have to be exactly 50. It could even be 100 in, under some circumstances. But as you start getting north of 50, it gets harder and harder to make a, a good return, no matter how well the company does, at least in a reasonable amount of time. Um, uh, based on the numbers that I, I have given you, I think that in order for a therapeutics company credibly to be able to build an idea and actually move compounds forward, it has to figure out very quickly how it's going to get access to at least $100 million. So right there you see there's a discrepancy. Uh, and I'll come back to how I think you can try to overcome that discrepancy. If a company really shows promise and has a platform that is showing productivity and the potential to create uh, more than one uh, compound, then my observation is that very quickly, and I mean within about five years, that company has to start thinking about how it's going to get access to three, four, or five hundred million dollars. So those are the kind of numbers that we're talking about. And, um, and the final number that I'll mention is that uh, everybody involved really needs to believe <clears throat> that they have a reasonable potential to see creation of value three years from the start of a company. That doesn't mean realization of value. That doesn't mean you take your money out and go home. But if, if there's not a credible plan that some significant risks can be overcome in roughly a three-year period uh, that would then increase the value of the company, then it begs the question, is this the right time to start that company? So <clears throat> um, that's some of the, the kind of backdrop. And, now, just to give you uh, a general framework for, uh, you know, sort of ways to categorize companies. Broadly, investors and, and people in the startup world think of product companies and they think of platform companies. And product companies, and of course there are variations on this, typically focus essentially all of their energy from the beginning on advancing a single product from whatever stage uh, it is when they get that product through to a stage that is um, added enough value and lowered enough risk that that can be monetized. So those tend to be essentially binary bets. They either work or they don't. Platform company is really what the whole basis for life science um, <coughs> uh, venture investing uh, was, was started on, and that is to invest in big ideas which could, at least in theory, produce multiple products, and then over time, by demonstrating the potential uh, of, that, uh, of that idea, uh, you'd get paid for it. I think that that's uh, a way that a lot of people separate the world, and there's been a movement away from platform companies among many investors over the past few years because of the sense that it is too expensive and the numbers just don't add up and it's going to take too long and you need to be much more focused in order to create value. Um, I think that there's many ways to, to, uh, to make money and create value, so I won't, I'm not dismissing that. But I believe that platform companies are still uh, the, not only um, the reason to be doing what we're doing, 
um, but also the best way to create value if it's done right. Uh, there are big platforms and there are small platforms. People will <clears throat> sometimes come and say, I've got a platform company based on a new kind of assay for a particular uh, <clears throat> receptor on a cell. That's a small platform, and that's not what I'm talking about. Um, there's also technology platforms and there's biology platforms. Uh, technology platforms are, are typically platforms that represent a very tangible invention that somebody has come up with, with a clear way of getting a patent on it, uh, and with the potential to address a bunch of different problems. Um, and that's probably been the most traditional basis for biotechnology companies, is technology platforms. Um, biology platforms are a little bit more amorphous. It's often a way of thinking about it, an area of biology, a set of insights into how that area of biology works that, uh, that are different from how people thought previously. Sometimes there's not a lot of intellectual property at the beginning because those things are, are hard to protect. Um, but I'm going to argue in a few minutes that I think that that's actually often the, the most uh, exciting basis for starting a company. Um, <clears throat> When, when we think about, uh, more specifically, uh, issues around uh, starting a biotechnology company or investing in one, there's many questions that, that come to mind and many things that we try to address. Um, I'd like to pause for a minute because I'm going to go through a number of these things, some of which are technical, some of which are less technical, but I'm going to pause because one of them is so much more important than everything else that I'm going to say that if you only remember one thing that I said, this is what I think you should remember. The number one thing that we invest in is people. It's all about the people. Uh, we love technology, we love science, and we'll talk to anybody about science as long as, as they're willing to talk with us. And we, we really get into the details. Um, but that's not what ultimately makes an early stage company successful uh, on its own. Uh, uh, the success of companies, I think, has at least as much to do with the will of management, its ability to adapt, um, and its ability to make things happen as to the particulars of the data. And so it's really all about people. And this plays out in a bunch of different ways. Um, uh, many companies are started as a partnership between um, some people in academia and uh, some investors and, and some management people. And uh, uh, what, what we look for in aggregate is um, people whose, whose ideas are highly compelling, people who are personally very compelling, and people who are really committed because uh, startup companies are a, a, an amazing act of commitment. And uh, everybody sort of has to be on the same page and be all in. Um, somewhere in the company, early on and central, there's got to be an entrepreneurial core. And the, the, the term entrepreneur is one that's widely used. And, and we talk at almost every one of our partners' meetings about what that means. We think of ourselves as entrepreneurs. Um, and uh, I think it can be a very long discussion, but among some of the qualities that an entrepreneur has, I think uh, are vision, uh, independence and independent thinking, uh, drive, uh, creativity, um, urgency. But people often ask me, you know, if, if you had one uh, you could only choose one characteristic of a CEO of a company, what would it be? And my answer is constructive paranoia. And what I mean by that is that um, there's got to be somebody who is so worried about all of the bad things that, are, that could happen, all of the co co uh, ways that the competition could, could, uh, could win, um, uh, et cetera, that um, – uh, that person needs to be thinking <clears throat> sort of three steps ahead of everybody else in the room 
of what those things might be and, and the constructive part is how to deal with them. So um, there's a lot more, of course, to being an entrepreneur, but I think that some of those things are very important. Uh, you need to get people who are authoritative in the area. Um, <clears throat> and you need people who are oriented to value. <clears throat> a common, common story <clears throat> in the startup world is that <clears throat> a company did well and the investors did poorly. And often that happens because <clears throat> the company does well partly by just raising money at whatever price and however much money it takes and not being oriented to value and creating value and return for shareholders. Um, the way that I sum all of this up, and everybody I think makes these judgments their own way, is <clears throat> are the people that you're getting involved with A plus? Um, and I would suggest that if anybody uh, is thinking about starting a company, um, that that's a, a useful criterion. Um, uh, are A-plus people being attracted to the company? Do A-plus people want to get involved? Um, when the people in that company uh, go and meet people in another company, uh, uh, does the other company look at them as people that they have to respect? So. I, I, <clears throat> I know I've gone on a little bit um, long about that, but it is uh, because I think it is the most central aspect of what we do. Uh, beyond that, though, I think there's a number of, of questions that I find useful uh, to ask when we're presented with an opportunity or thinking about an opportunity. The first one is, <clears throat> I think, very important. And, and the, that question is, is, is the game worth the candle? By which I mean, often, somebody will come in and they'll make an amazing claim. They'll say, I can do something. And if, if you have a uh, scientific background, certainly, uh, or uh, um, you, know, you are a realist, many of us are inclined to automatically think of the 10 reasons that could not be true. And, and, and any one of those reasons may ultimately be a reason not to pursue it. But the first question is, if it were true, would it be worth it? Um, and, and I think that, that uh, if the answer to that is yes, it's worth then suspending disbelief for a moment and trying to understand why this person is so excited. Um, another question is <clears throat> has two parts. One is, is the idea that this person is presenting uh, incredibly the best approach to solve the problem that they're proposing to solve that's out there. Um, so sometimes people will come because they, they have worked in a particular area and they'll say, um, I've come up with the, the best, uh, well, this, this, had, this had come up in the past and now this is changing, but in the past people, people would say, well, I have the best idea for cancer vaccines that's out there. And this has been a very troubled area for a long time and that may be changing now. Um, and so even if you granted them that it was the best idea, then the, question, the second part of the question is, is that idea good enough? Because there's some areas where the best idea is still not good enough. Um, I'll give you an example. If somebody came today and said, I have the best idea for curing schizophrenia that anybody's ever had, that may be true. But is their idea likely to be good enough to cure schizophrenia now? Um, well, we'd have to hear them out, but the chances are that the answer is no. So I think that the an you'd like the answer to both of those questions be, uh, be affirmative. Um, uh, another, another question is, um, is, the is, is the playing field level? Uh, when you're faced with a proposition, uh, I always want to feel like I have an unfair advantage. Uh, level playing fields are good for your kids playing soccer, but not for investors. Uh, so I think that you've got to believe that there's some element of a potential investment that is so much of an advantage over the, rest of the, the way the rest of the world does it that, um, that you will uh, um, be able in an unfair way to beat the competition. Um, and, uh, and then finally, and I think this is the, the most difficult question that we all face as we think about early stage companies is, is the timing right? 
I, I think it's somewhat easy to predict um, uh, where uh, there will be progress in the future. Alzheimer's disease uh, would be an example. The question is, is, uh, is the timing right to make an investment and create value now based on all of the knowledge that's available and the risks that are there? Um, going down sort of one more level, uh, uh, when, um, when we hear about new science, uh, uh, it's most exciting to us when, when we feel that that science has a potential to be transformative. Um, and uh, one way that, that uh, you get the sense that that may be the case is if when somebody describes their science to you, um, you come away saying, I have never heard anybody um, uh, describe that, 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 that way. Uh, and that uh, conversation changed how I think about the, the world in some meaningful way. Uh, I, to me, that is a very good sort of calibrator of uh, uh, how potentially profound the science is. Another question is, is the science actionable? In other words, no matter how exciting it is, um, practically speaking, uh, is it possible to act on it today? Uh, you know, an example of this would be <coughs> um, anti-sense uh, technology, which was developed in the, uh, in the 90s uh, to block particular genes. And there was a lot of excitement about it. A number of companies were started around anti-sense. But the issue was that nobody ever really was able to, to address early on how to get this stuff into cells and therefore how to act on it. And there's been a lot of progress more recently, but that's taken a long time. Um, uh, I think that all biotech companies sooner or later become biology companies. And by that I mean whether they started with a product whether they started with a technology platform or whether they started with a biology platform, ultimately they get into a particular area of biology where they have to um, make the nuanced judgments with incomplete information about um, whether a target is validated enough, uh, uh, whether um, uh, you know, all of the preclinical data um, really add up to a promising story whether that points in one clinical direction or another clinical direction. So companies like Genentech, which, were, which was a technology company, became uh, a cancer company. Uh, companies like um, uh, Vertex, uh, which was a technology company, became largely a hepatitis company. Uh, Millennium became a cancer company. Biogen became an, an MS company, uh, and then built on that. So. Um, uh, <clears throat> um, I think that the important point there is that, that at the end of the day, it really is all about the biology um, that's underlying um, what a company does and their ability to, to manage that authoritatively that is going to increase their chance of success. Um, uh, uh, another um, area where I think companies have more or less chance of success is in, is in terms of how sophisticated they are about understanding um, uh, not just the disease that they're going into, but what a disease is um, in its most basic elements. If you look at um, uh, how diseases are classified, uh, there's quite a range. Um, the best classification, the most precise classification of diseases is either infectious diseases, where either you have it or you don't, and there's no question. So if, if you say somebody has pneumococcal pneumonia, you just gave a lot of information on what that person's problem is and precise information. Or single genetic mutations, uh, where that mutation is the disease. But at the other end of the spectrum, a lot of so-called diseases are not diseases at all. They're just syndromes. They're a, a, a mixture of symptoms and signs, which could be from a range of different biological processes, which may overlap uh, to some extent. Um, but um, uh, which uh, ultimately are a very bad um, uh, basis for drug discovery. So I see that I'm, 
uh, things are getting uh, a little long, so I'll, I'll wrap up. There's a number of additional criteria, but I'll, I'll just finish this with a, an anecdote about a company that we started that we're very proud of, which I think is an illustration of what is possible in today's world. Um, about five years ago, uh, we had a conversation with Lou Cantley, who's a renowned cancer researcher at the, far, at, uh, the, the Beth Israel. And Lou uh, told us about a new way that he was thinking about how metabolism contributed to cancer and a number of other diseases. And as soon as he went through this story, we said, this is so different from anything we've heard and so compelling. And we could see how we could develop drugs off of this. And so we, along with our colleagues at Arch Ventures, uh, put seed money into the company before there was a business plan, before there was a team. And then over the next six months, we're able to attract the kind of people um, that were of lose quality uh, with management experience um, and uh, started that company with uh, a significant commitment of $33 million of Series A capital, which is quite substantial uh, in our world. Uh, 18 months later, we were able to raise $130 million of very cheap capital uh, from a pharmaceutical company, and that's led to being able to raise significant additional capital. And that, co that uh, company now is about to put uh, two or three things in the clinic. So I think despite how difficult this world is, uh, if you um, apply a very disciplined approach uh, and you get it right, uh, there's still the potential to do very exciting things and uh, to create a lot of value. Um, well, thanks for having me. Thanks, Doug, for the great introduction. I'm trying to fill in some holes now. Um, and, uh, and I'm trying to uh, tell the story a little bit from an angle of, of pharma. Um, so SR1 is uh, the corporate venture arm of uh, GlaxoSmithKline. Uh, we have been in business since 1986. It's the second oldest uh, corporate venture fund after JGDC. Um, it's fairly unusual. There are only a handful of venture funds who actually stayed in the game all, all the time. You saw a lot of uh, pharma companies starting <coughs> initiatives and going out of it again, in and out. SO1 and JJDC have been around for a long time and are very committed <coughs> to venture. Um, when we talk about corporate venture, um, people try to put them into one bucket, but they're actually really very different. Um, you have venture funds that are very strategic, um, where it's pretty clear what they're looking for because it has to align with the strategy of the mothership. Um, I mean, one very strategic fund, for example, is Baxter Ventures. I mean, they have a very clear focus what they're looking for. Then there are other venture funds uh, that are very independent, and their, their mission really is to find technologies and innovation that, uh, you know, will become strategic in seven to ten years, um, but are not really aligned to what the mothership is doing right now. Pharma typically works on a kind of a three-year cycle in their strategic re review. Um, you, hear, you read this in the news sometimes, you know, a therapeutic area has dropped, the therapeutic area is picked up again, and usually it's kind of a, on, in a, on a three-year cycle. Um, when you're in venture long enough, you know that three years is almost impossible for venture. You need five to seven years. That's kind of our time horizon most of the time. Um, so SR1 uh, is very independent. We don't have to go through any committees at GSK. Um, we're pretty much acting like any other institutional investor. It's actually interesting through some of the fundraising problems uh, for institutional venture funds. Some institutional venture funds have actually become more corporate funds than some of the corporate funds because they have strategic money now, um, which is a very uh, funny thing. So you really have to look under the hood to really understand how uh, a fund ticks and what they're really looking for. Um, SR1 is at the stage now where we pretty much leading or co-leading all our deals. So we're not uh, a bystander, or we're not a follower, or we're not kind of dumb money, as people thought for a long time for corporate venture uh, money. We're also not valuation insensitive. That's one of those big myths out there that you know we don't care about valuation. Um, that's absolutely not true. Um, because I think the number that Doug uh, threw out about the 50 million, that's a number that's important for anybody who's investing. You have to be very, very careful how much money you raise and what your valuation is if you want to make money in the end. Um, 
so the strategy really is to put the innovation bar extremely high. SR1 has the luxury that we don't have to go out and uh, fundraise. Uh, we're an evergreen fund. Um, we are um, investing directly from the balance sheet of the mothership. Um, we're trying to employ 30 to 50 million a year, which translates into anywhere five to 10 deals, new deals per year. Um, we have currently a portfolio about around 30 companies. Um, and uh, we're 10 investment managers in four offices. So we're investing globally. We're in Cambridge, we're in uh, Pennsylvania, uh, we're in San Francisco, and we're out in London. Um, so what we are really looking for is something that will change the way how medicine is done today for the better. And that can really be anything, because one thing I think that pharma is learning now, that the future will not be just a pill. Uh, I think just making a pearl is not enough anymore. I think pharma is slowly moving also to uh, the concept of pearl plus. You have to kind of have a package around the pearl. What is that package? That package is that you have to understand your patient much better. You have to select your patient much better. You might want to have a companion diagnostic. You might want to have early um, diagnosis of some diseases. Uh, you want to be able to not only give a therapeutic in, in terms of a small molecule or a biologic, it can also be a device. It could be, um, it could be a piece of material. It could be electronics. Um, so I think uh, a lot of people in pharma are opening their visors, so to speak, and, and actually look to convergence. I mean, how can you apply some of the learnings you uh, had over the last 50, 60, 70 years in typical small molecules and try to apply the same principles, you know, for other forms of uh, therapeutics. Um, and that's really what we're looking for. We have a very, very broad view now uh, about uh, investments. We're investing in normal therapeutics, devices, diagnostics, materials, electronics, bionics, and even IT. Um, so we're, we're very open-minded in that way. Um, why are we doing this as a corporate venture fund? Um, when we do an investment, we don't have special rights. So GSK has no special rights in any of our investments. There's a very substantial firewall between whatever we do and the mothership. Um, we will not tell any confidential information to whatever's uh, uh, happening in the company. So there are no special rights. Um, the reason why pharma is doing this is that they're really concerned about the, the long-term pipeline. Um, because the funding environment has been really, really difficult, there are very, very few people right now who are taking actually risks and go into very early stage or do venture creation. Um, and, and that's an issue because everybody knows if we don't uh, find those new technologies and we don't try really to do the translational piece and do the commercial commercialization of those ideas, the pipelines in seven years will be empty, um, and that would not be a good thing for pharma. Um, so that's, that's really the reason why there are corporate venture funds. I think they, they really try to help fostering the environment for novel ideas and, and really get uh, new technologies funded. Um, and also, you know, really take some risk. Um, one of the things that we are trying to find in, in, in novel companies is really to change something in the underlying equation. And Doug has mentioned the, the enormous cost of $2 billion per drug. The $2 billion does not mean that you need $2 billion drugs to be successful and take a molecule all the way to the market, but it includes all the attrition. So it includes all the stuff that doesn't go, wrong, that doesn't go right. Um, and if you look at, you know, all the innovation that went into um, um, biotechnology and pharma over the last 25 years, say, um, the underlying attrition in the clinic has not changed. That's one of the most frustrating things in our business, that we still have pretty much the same failure in the clinic. Um, and I think as long as we don't change that, we will not change the price tag because it just costs too much money. We have to um, try too many ideas. Um, and we're losing too much time to really get one molecule finally through all the way to the end. Um, so changing that attrition um, is, is really one thing I'm particularly interested in. And, and there are a lot of different ways how we can do this. Um, one of the things, um, and I think venture is learning this the hard way right now, 
is that you have to be really, really, really careful what you put into the clinic. Um, because I think one of the issues has been in the past that molecules or therapeutics went into the clinic that, that just didn't have any business going into clinical trials. Um, so making sure that you put something to the clinic that really lives up to what you try to achieve is one of the most important things we're looking at. <clears throat> How do you get there? Um, one, it starts actually very early, um, and now there's a number that, that sounds very ugly, but I think, I mean, I will ask you if you kind of agree. The number that's floating around between investors of reproducible experiments out of academia is 20%. 80% of what's published and what's done in academic labs, we think, is not reproducible. Um, so that really is you know, pretty bad because no, you're taking high risk, you don't know how you end up in the clinic, plus you take a risk that you know, some of the experiments you think it, you know, is your, uh, uh, your thesis for an investment, you know, they have a one in five chance to be wrong as well. Um, so that's one little angle where we as SR1 try to do something. Um, we actually um, have committed now a million dollars per year uh, to do killer experiments, um, which means we sit down with entrepreneurs and PIs, we look at you know, their piece of biology, their data, their experiments, and we look, we look at those data you know, with uh, the eyes of a pharma company that really has to go into clinical trials. And we either say, well, you know, this really looks interesting, but we would love to repeat it. Most of the time, we're probably going to add one or two controls because very often the right controls are missing. Um, but we could also add, you know, a couple of animal models, and we would finance this. We would pay for this experiment. There's no company formation, but we say we're going to pay for this with a third party. You know, we, we find a very good lab that can run these experiments. We pay for the experiment. If the data comes back, good. Um, then, you know, we have something to talk about. Um, we have now two or three of these things. We started this initiative this year. Two or three things running this way, and uh, our first one actually just came back and the data reproduced, so I'm very happy. Um, so this is one, one thing I think everybody of you on the science side, you know, you should really work very hard to make sure that you have, you have done your killer experiment or try to figure out what is an early killer experiment. This unfortunately runs a little bit against the whole way our science is funded in this country because the one thing you don't want to do if you live off grants is to do a killer experiment because you will kill your grant. Um, and that's a real, real issue. Um, and I think the, the, the community in general has to work on this issue because I think it, it, it is really a big, big problem. And, um, and we're pushing hard now, really, you know, to get people to accept the fact that we will not start companies without, you know, repeating one of the key experiments. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is that we are <coughs> trying to really combine silos. Um, one thing we, we've seen in, in pharma is that people very much stay within their silos. Um, you have a preclinical world, scientific world, then you kind of have the, uh, the INT stage, early clinical world, then you have late stage clinical trials, and then you have markets. Then you have outcomes. Um, but for some reason, we still are not at that point where we have actually have a full horizontal that goes and takes actually data from anywhere in this full horizontal and tries to make sense out of it. Um, and I think there are huge opportunities, I think, to really start working with outcomes. And I think we, we do some, we have some inroads now with the development of EHRs. I think the administration in Washington has great incentives to actually use outcomes and put them into clinical uh, trial, early clinical trial decision making. Um, and I think there are actually fantastic opportunities for new companies that are, are able to um, ask some real-time questions. So, you know, what are the patients that I'm trying to address actually really look like? You know, what, what other drugs are they taking? What are the drug-drug interactions? What are their experiences? All these things are very important because ultimately it will, ha it will help to select a patient pool for some of the important early clinical trials that is enriched in terms of the patients you really want to treat. Um, so we're looking for all kinds of technologies that, that will help us to bring these silos together. Um, it's very early. Um, people you know, speak very different languages in, this, in those silos. 
and you have to deal with some of the HIPAA questions, some of the questions around uh, confidentiality of, uh, of uh, uh, personal health data. But, but I think it's actually a fantastic time to think, think about this long horizontal and try to really com combine data. Um, So that really means that one thing we can change, and that comes back to the attrition question, is that biotech companies and, and companies in the early stages don't rush into quick and dirty trials in, in the clinic. Um, I think it has become more and more important to really rather spend $5 million more on the first clinical trial and do it right than trying to get a very quick answer that is, you know, ultimately not really worth very much. Um, and you actually see this now in the investing, in the way how investors uh, look at companies. Um, what you see out there is a changing environment. And, you know, there's a lot of talk, for example, about the value of death. Um, I don't know if people have heard this. Um, where people think that, that, you know, a lot of technologies get stuck and then they don't get funding anymore. I think there are actually two values, values of death. There's not one value of death. The first value of death, I think, is only a perception value of death, and that's the early translation. If you have a really good idea as an, as an uh, scientist and an entrepreneur, and you, can con and you can repeat this experiment, you will find money. I, I, I'm very much convinced about this. And if you look at the rate how you know, companies really um, are started, it has slowed out somewhat, but it has not slowed down to zero. So I think companies with good ideas are started every day right now. Um, and you know, we're an early stage investor. Uh, we have started three new companies in a very, very early stage this year. So this is happening. Uh, so I think there is not really a value of death if you have a really good idea where you can reproduce the early results and you can build a piece of biology or a hypothesis that really can stand up uh, to a new treatment um, idea. The second value of death, and that's, that's the one that we are faced with, is you start a company, you put the first 20 million in, and the idea was that with the 15 to 20 million, you, co you come to a proof of concept or value inflection point, all kinds of nice words. Uh, most of the time, you don't get there. So very, very often you spend you know, the first 15 to 20 million, and you are not at the point where you have proven that your idea works in man. Um, and that's the real problem because at this point and under the current uh, um, economic uh, uh, environment, you, you actually have not created any value. You spend 50 million and you know you can go out and raise new money, but you know they will cram you down to a couple of million. So you lost, you lost 15 million on, on your investment. Um, that's a real issue. One thing that you see right now is, is that investors actually try to bake in much more money from the get-go. So if you have an early idea, you can convince enough investors that it's a valid idea, you can repeat it, you do a killer experiment, you try to find 50 million around the table, which means that you don't want to spend all the 50 million, but if you're not there with 15 or 20 million, you have enough money around the table to go, go an extra 5 million and don't cut corners. I think that's the environment you're seeing right now. You almost don't see any typical Series B, Series Cs anymore. You have pretty large Series As that have money baked in to really get to the point where you prove it works in man. Proof to work that it works in man is not enough anymore as well. Um, there's always the words, uh, you know, people have used it a long time, proof of concept. Um, I have actually moved away from the word proof of concept. Um, and I'm more looking now at proof of relevance. Because you can show that a piece of biology works in man the way how you thought uh, it should work, you know, from your rat and mouse experiments. But whether you have a commercial product is a completely different question. So I think proof of relevance really includes that you have to understand, is there a medical need that you can address with what, which whatever you have in your hands? Is there a market? Is there a way to commercialize it? Is there a way to get it reimbursed? And will there be adoption? All these questions have to go into um, building companies earlier than ever. I mean, you pretty much have to ask all these questions from the get-go. Um, and you, don't, you, you typically don't know this question when you, you know, you're a scientist. So I think getting in touch with people who can help you making all these judgment calls is absolutely essential. And that comes back to the people again. 
there are people, and we, you know, we, we, we're getting, as investors, we, we're, getting, we're going back to the same people again and again who are just really, really good in looking at the whole proof of relevance package, who can really help to position whatever you have and put it into the marketplace. And that way, raise the chance that you actually have a product significantly. Um, this is actually also something that, you know, a call out to something like the Stem Cell Institute, to everybody who's really in translational medicine or translational uh, sciences, you have to reach out to commercial people. You have to ask those questions. You have to invite them. And you have to learn about those things because it is absolutely key that you understand, you know, what it really takes to have a product. Product is different from an idea. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff in between, and you have to fill that out. Um, so I think proof of relevance, um, that, that's something that, that has become very important for us <coughs> as well. Um, so I want to finish um, with, you know, you said um, that there, there might not be many things to be optimistic about. Um, I think if you're a real entrepreneur and you have constructive paranoia, you need only one thing to be optimistic about, and then really, you know, s stay with it. You know, I think um, being an entrepreneur is an incredible thing. Um, you know, it's all-consuming, and, you know, it, it's, it's the one thing that keeps me in this industry because working with those people is just amazing. You know, you feel, you feel so bad, you know, if you look what you do, you know, uh, in comparison to an entrepreneur who puts everything on the line. Um, the rewards are amazing because if something really works, it's the best thing you will ever do in your life. Um, so if you have one thing to be optimistic about, stay with it and get the right people, ask the right questions, and you'll have fun. So, of course, one of the challenges of coming last in a very accomplished group is you may have noticed me checking my, my points. Um, uh, I'm Terry McGuire. I'm a founder of a firm called Polaris uh, Ventures. Uh, we started in 96, and so I'm an entrepreneur myself. Uh, I've been in the venture capital business for 25 years. Uh, and full disclosure, uh, I'm not a biologist. I'm not a trained physician. My last biology class was in high school. I'm an engineer and by training, a business, uh, have a business degree from across the parking lot. Uh, and um, uh, but I've been doing this business for the last, as I say, 25 years. Uh, Polaris, uh, as, I, as I said, is, uh, is a diversified fund. We, uh, about a third of what we do is in the life science category. Of that, probably 40% is biotech. 25 to 30% is med tech. The rest would be services and healthcare IT. Um, and I would say that uh, there's clearly been a trend away from diversified funds. Uh, the funds have become much more specialized lately, uh, and for a lot of good reasons. Although, with that said, Diversification has worked well for us, um, and I think diversification has worked well because it allows us to invest in high-risk moments when everyone else is running away. Diversity is this wonderful thing. When everyone's, typically, when everyone's running from an opportunity, you should be running at it, an opportunity. But typically, if you're over-concentrated, you, you tend to get nervous about a space. And so I think diversity has worked out well, well for us. And we've spent probably about $1.2 billion in our life science portfolio over the last uh, 17 years. So it's been a, su a substantial uh, amount of capital. I myself have been in, involved with about 50 companies uh, through my 26, 27 years. Um, and probably a third of those remain in my portfolio. The rest uh, have had some liquidity. Um, Again, I, I'm going to attempt not to repeat uh, what Jens and Doug said because I think what they said, you may have noticed me nodding as well. I thought what they had a lot of w really wise advice. Uh, so let me just compliment some of the things that they said. Um, the, um, for Polaris, uh, it has always been about translational science. Uh, we are not looking for Me Too products. We're not looking for fast followers. We're not looking for the lowest cost proposition. Uh, but we really want stuff that's really going to make an enormous difference. We're well aware of the risks, uh, and typically when you take those kinds of risks, you often have as many failures as you have successes. Um, but what we found is that, like, like great science, failure can lead you to the next great opportunity. And in fact, some of the entrepreneurs that we've backed, we've backed because they failed, and they failed quickly. They've, they've come to a decision, they've done the killer experiment, they come back to us and they say, guys, we like it. Let's tell you the truth now. We're going to we're going to tell ourselves the truth. We're going to do the right thing here. We're not going to pursue this anymore. 
Uh, and that, by the way, is not a dreaded moment. In fact, as a venture capitalist, that's a welcome moment. And there's plenty of stories of people that came in six months after they started their company, walked in, said it's not going to work. They sold their technology. And the next day, the venture capitalists were knocking on their door to back them again. So don't be fearful of failure. Uh, the worst kind of failure is when it takes you 10 or 15 years. But quick failure actually is a plus. And so I wouldn't I'd, I'd, I'd stress that. Um, the um, the, my, my biggest concerns, and again, some of the stuff that was described earlier, is the changing environment. Uh, 25 years ago, when I, when I came into the venture capital business, uh, if you built it and had a, had a drug or a device that was going to save people's lives, you knew you could sell it, you knew you could make a profit at it, you knew someone would pay for it. Um, that's not always clear these days. Uh, clearly, under the changing healthcare system, as Jens pointed out, Reimbursement is not a guarantee anymore. You could, we've had, I've had companies get all the way through the clinic, get the, the clinicians love it, the FDA approves a product, we go to get someone to pay for it, and no one wants to pay for it. And that is a dreaded moment, I can tell you for sure, because again, these numbers get quite large. So um, I think what we, so the, the, the environment has changed. Um, uh, we worry about reimbursement, we worry about regulation, uh, the FDA has gotten slower. Um, because I, and I can, as a, if I were an FDA regulator, I'd understand it because if you get it wrong, you get called before Congress, you get read the Riot Act, you get told how you're a fool. And so they're, they're not prepared to do that. But as a result, the FDA is prepared to take no risk at all. Uh, and then ultimately, from a reimbursement perspective, they're not allowed to take many risks as well. So I'm concerned about that. Um, and then ultimately, of course, time is money. And so this, this $50 million, I mean, if we go back in our portfolio, we've certainly made money in companies that have raised more than $50 million. But the best returns have come from companies that have raised $50 million or less, $25, 30000000 million. So that goes to, the, to what I would say is the, I want to come back to the people topic. And, and uh, it's really important. Um, we have, uh, through the life of Polaris, um, generated these wonderful relationships with academic entrepreneurs. Um, the most discussed in our portfolio, the most celebrated in our portfolio is a relationship we have with Bob Langer at MIT. Many of you may know Bob Langer. Uh, he's quite prolific. We have now uh, backed 18, one eight of Bob's companies. Uh, they've generated a very substantial return from our investors. As importantly, <clears throat> if you look at the number of diseases that they're targeting, it's probably 35 or 40 different disease states. If you look at the, the world population that they could touch, it's over 2.5 billion people could be touched by Langer Lab companies. And we're involved in some of those companies as well. <clears throat> it isn't just Polaris. So we have consistently gone back to get stated relationships, people that we know who have this great instinct about what is not just great research, but what's great commercializable research. And by the way, commercializable within our time frame because a venture capital firm lasts for 10 years. It doesn't last forever. You have an evergreen fund. We don't. Uh, and our limited partners are prepared to stick around for 10 or maybe 12 or 13 years, but they're not prepared to st stick around for 20 or 30 years. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, knowing the difference between great research and great commercializable research is hugely important. And what we have found is by working with guys like Bob Langer or, 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 or Phil Sharp at MIT or Paul Schimmel down at the Scripps or Tillman Gerngross up at Dartmouth, they understand this, this difference between great research and great commercializable research. And so there's plenty of examples when Tillman or Bob will present some science when I'll walk in to, or you'll walk in and we'll knock on Bob's door and he'll say, boy, isn't that a good company? And Bob will say, hold the phone, give us another couple of years. It just isn't right yet. And that for a researcher is an extraordinary moment because typically the funding is so difficult these days. Most researchers want any capital they can get. So I think you should just be aware of that. So for us at least, this sort of stated relationships that we have with these handful of, uh, of really successful entrepreneurs is something which has been very productive for us and something we'll continue to go back on. We talked about constructive paranoia and um, I'd, I'd actually challenge that a little bit. Um, I think paranoia can be a very powerful and, and, and informative um, uh, trait, uh, and certainly the constructive nature, and this may be what you're getting at, but um, I think the best entrepreneurs are the most, they're not just the smartest entrepreneurs, they're the cleverest entrepreneurs. And clever is sort of a funny word, right? It, there's, it's hard to put your arms around clever. But clever means they find ways to do things that other people can't do, including collecting resources. Really, a really clever entrepreneur, and again, I'll pick on Tillman. Tillman's grown gross up at Dartmouth. He'll start a company. 
He won't raise a lot of money. He'll collect a lot of great people around it. He'll find other people that are prepared to pay for his research. And so when he comes back, he doesn't need very much capital. I think the first company we raised $30 million. The next company we've raised less than $30 million. The company we're currently working on is going to raise less than $30 million. He's found a clever way to gain resources and collect resources. And I think that is also a characteristic. You need to be constructive, and you certainly need to be paranoid. But I think this cleverness is what distinguishes really good entrepreneurs from really great entrepreneurs. And figuring that out, and those are easy words for me to say, and for you, anyone who wants to start a company, you can scratch your head and say, now, am I clever or not? I don't really know. But I think that's the distinguishing characteristic that we're continually looking for. Um, so one of the questions that, that, you know, that was asked uh, prior to coming in to here, which is how has the world changed? And I want to talk about that for a second. Um, I think it is a mixed bag. I think as, as Doug and Jens have talked about, it's harder out there now. There's less capital around. Um, the number of venture capitalists investing in, in life science companies has moved away. Returns have not been, for the industry, have not been good. Limited partners, those that invest in us, don't like life science right now, I'll be honest with you. Uh, there are some firms, such as ours, which have generated nice returns, and I think they're happy to fund us. But that no, the number of firms has gotten smaller. So there's not nearly as much capital as there once was. Um, I think there's um, the, uh, the, the regulatory environment, as I described, is as is, is rigorous and difficult as it's ever been. Um, and that's only a problem that, that needs to be solved. And I think that can't be solved at the micro level of a company. That has to be solved at the macro level of the government. And it speaks to what our government wants to take risks at and how they want to solve people's problems. But we're not going to solve that ourselves. We just have to be aware of it. Um, reimbursement we talked about as being a real problem. Um, I, I would say that um, the other problem that runs along with the raising capital is just the number of investors required to support a company. We talked about a $50 million first round. Ten years ago, you would have never, ever, ever heard of a $50 million first round. It just wouldn't have happened. And yet this whole idea of syndication is becoming much more important. So if you start a company, be aware of that. Syndication can be a wonderful thing if you pick the right partners. It can be a treacherous thing if partners are, have a different uh, agenda. Um, the good news about corporates like SR1 um, and JDCC and uh, JDC and others, they t Novartis, they tend to behave m much more like we do. They tend to look at the same things. But then there are other corporates out there that you might invite in that have a, a unique agenda, and you have to be aware of how that plays within their syndicate dynamics. With those as challenges, uh, you know, I couldn't be more excited about investing in life science right now. Um, the teams, the maturity of the entrepreneurial community has only gotten better. For sure. But if I look 25 years ago, you guys are a much more informed, a much better group than we were looking at 25 years ago. Um, the science, of course, is only accelerating. Um, and the, the, the sort of the amazement that we, you know, we look at when we look at some of these companies that come in, what they can do or what they're proposing to do has just been remarkable. Um, the, this sort of c ecosystem of pharma and biotech and venture, and our ecosystem is a very for the most part, friendly and collaborative ecosystem. If you go on the tech side of the house, if you go into IT, it's all about competition. It's all about knocking people around. When a corporate and a venture capitalist and an entrepreneur tend to meet now, it tends to be a much more collaborative path. And so I think that's a really, really good thing. The ecosystem all works for people these days. Um, uh, and then finally, um, you know, we all want to live forever. Uh, the truth of the matter is there's plenty of consumers of health care services and products, and, so, and, and ultimately people are prepared to pay for that. So I think the problems haven't been solved. The technology is only getting better. The, the, the sort of the quality of the entrepreneurs has only gotten better as well. The, um, so so uh, we were asked again, what, what were the, what's investable? I mentioned before for us it's, it's, it's transformative science. Um, I talked about a clever uh, entrepreneur. I want to talk about a clever capital model. People who find capital efficient models, again, going back to the 50 year, are really ideas that attract us as a partnership. When we're sitting around and talking about a new company, if it has this, the old, we're going to raise $150 million over the next 10 years, it's more likely to be thrown out of the partnership at that moment. It's just, it isn't very clever. Um, and so we're looking for those clever capital models, business models. Um, Again, I'm trying not to repeat what was already previously said. Um, so maybe I'll, in fact, I will 
to sum up what, what, what history has shown me after 25 years, um, that brilliant science really is, at the end of the day, what we're backing. Um, that uh, the areas that you think are hot today are the areas that you don't want to invest in, that I think. I think if by the time we invest in a hot area, by the time it becomes a mature company, it's no longer hot. So we're always, that's why diversity works for us. It allows us to go in areas where people are, are not terribly excited about them. Um, again, this idea of that the team needs to be clever, it needs to be more than just smart. Um, uh, teams that have the ability to collect resources, collect people. Uh, oftentimes, I will be convinced when an entrepreneur walks in, not just by looking at the science or the product or the business model, but who has he or she put on the board of directors? Who have they got as scientific advisors? <coughs> have they had the capability to go and collect really talented people? And if the answer is yes, then I'll get excited. And if the answer is no, then I may not get nearly as excited. Um, uh, I think Jens talked earlier about is the idea, or Doug did, is the idea too early or too late? Sometimes we've invested in ideas that are too late, that the, the moment passes before we can mature. Sometimes, for example, in the genetic space, genomic space, we've invested in companies that are far too early. That's still to be proven. Um, the, uh, you know, there's a debate going on now. Um, <laughs> I've only heard recently, which is this idea of the role of founders and how important founders are in companies. And, and I think the debate has to do with people knowing what they're good at. And, and, and most founders, when they start a company, uh, the Bill Gateses of the world are such a unique creatures that they start a company and then they take it to a billion or a 10 billion or 50 billion in revenue. Um, but I think a founder who well understands what their capabilities are and knows when it's going to be their time to move over is a really important thing. But having said that, I think when I look at our portfolio, when we've hired in the entrepreneurs, it's not worked nearly as well. I think you have to have this sort of founding group, this sort of, they're gonna protect the idea, they're gonna protect the capital, they're gonna steward this thing along, uh, is something that's hugely important. And so this idea that you know we want our founders to have a lot of the company, we want them to be incented to be there forever, we want them to be incredibly self-aware, uh, and oftentimes, and we, and we have had great success backing people that have no commercial experience, and the best example of that is just up the river at Ironwood. Peter Hecht uh, came out of MIT, came out of the Whitehead, started Iron, Ironwood, has remained the CEO of that company. It's trading at a billion and a half, um, two billion dollar market cap. It's got, it just got its drug approved. Uh, he's raised a lot of capital for the company. We've made a good return on it. But you would have never bet that Peter Hecht should, be, should have been a great CEO. He's turned out to be an, uh, just a very successful CEO. Uh, he's a founder. He's protecting the shareholders' interests all the time. But he's had this great capability of collecting talent into the company that he knows he doesn't have himself. So uh, for those of you starting companies, I would absolutely encourage you to do so. I think in some ways this is the best time ever. Uh, but as we've, as we've said over here, there's just a plenty of challenges in front of you. But if you think there's a period when there isn't challenges, you're kidding yourself. <laughs>